All right, welcome back to Neuromatch Conference version four. We're excited to have all of you joining us back for the second session today. And leading off that session is going to be our second keynote talk of the meeting. Um, it is my pleasure to have my colleague, Chetan Pandaranath here. He is on the faculty at Emory and Georgia Tech. He's an assistant professor of biomedical engineering and neurosurgery here. Um, excited to hear what Chetan has to tell us today. He just does uh, some fantastic science. Uh, he's been recognized with Sloan Fellowship and um, just recently with an NIH Director's New Innovator Award this year. So exciting things going on. Can't wait to hear about um, his new work on latent variable modeling of neural population dynamics. Where do we go from here? Chetan, welcome. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. Just a quick check. You can still hear me okay? All right. So first and foremost, I really want to thank the Neuromatch team for, for finding innovative ways to broaden access to all this wonderful information while also lowering our field's carbon footprint. This is really, really amazing work. As Chris said, my name is Chetan Pandernath. I'm faculty here at Emory University in Georgia Tech here in Atlanta, Georgia in the United States. And I'm really honored to speak here today. So we know that the rich sensory, motor, and cognitive functions that the brain performs arise from the collective activity of vast populations of neurons. And neural population analyses are a critical tool for probing these functions. Rather than focusing on how a neuron's activity relates to externally measurable variables like stimuli or movement, population analyses allow us to probe the in internal processes, that is how the activity of different neurons relates to each other and really gives us a window into the computation of a network. So population analyses are nothing new, but when you could only record a few neurons at a time, it used to be hard to get enough neurons to do these analyses. So a common approach was to use stereotype behavior. So making the assumption that if measurable behavior is the same across repeated trials, then the brain is doing the same thing across those trials. So we might record from a set of neurons during behaviors one through N, and then record from another set during the same behaviors and record from another set. And then, you know, you can aggregate those neurons recorded in separate recording windows and treat them as if they were all recorded at the same time. But this kind of traditional approach meant that population analyses were mainly restricted to looking at the average response properties of neurons under highly stereotyped behavioral conditions. But as we all know, this is changing. So our capacity to record from many neurons simultaneously is increasing dramatically. Um, Ian Stevenson and Conrad Kerting pointed out in this 2011 paper that this increasing trend shows exponential growth. So with a doubling time now of about every six years. So this presents a really key opportunity in systems and neuroscience. The idea of combining these large scale recording methods with new machine learning methods to, provide, to perform high resolution single trial analyses. And that could allow us to study neural processes that previously were really challenging to study. So things like non-stereotype behaviors where you can't average responses across multiple repeats of the same behavioral condition or processes where single trial variability is itself important. So cognitive processes such as attention or decision-making. And this is also important for brain machine interfaces that need to estimate intention from neural signals on a moment by moment basis. So today I'll tell you about some work we've done to leverage machine learning for high resolution, single trial analyses of neural population dynamics. I'll tell you about a tool we developed known as latent factor analysis via dynamical systems or LFADs and show you how we first applied it to model population dynamics when neural activity is highly predictable. Then I'll show you how we generalize the method for cases where activity can be unpredictable, and also a recent tool we developed known as AutoLFADS. Next, I'll tell you a little bit about 
how we're enabling powerful new applications of these tools, here uncovering single trial dynamics underlying two photon calcium signals with an approach known as radical. And finally, I'll tell you just a little bit about how we're trying to coordinate and really accelerate progress in the field more broadly by standardizing comparisons through a recent effort known as the Neural Latent Benchmark. And I'll just say, you know, this, there's clearly not enough time to go through all these stories in this short format. Um, these, these that I'm talking about, Otto Elfad, Radical, the Neural Latent Benchmark, they're all very recent. So, you know, um, one of the wonderful properties of open science is that you can go read the bioarchive preprint for Otto Elfads and Radical and the archive uh, preprint for neural latents that we're presenting at NeurIPS in a couple days. So first, let me give you a concept conceptual framework for what I mean when I'm talking about latent variable modeling and dynamics. So let's imagine we've recorded the activity of three neurons, which we summarized by the firing rate of each neuron as a function of time. We can visualize this activity using what we call a state space plot. So here, each axis is the firing rate of a given neuron. So in our simple example, um, you know, this axis is neuron one, neuron two, neuron three, and we can capture the activity of our simple three neuron population with a three-dimensional plot. So each axis represents the firing rate of a given neuron. So then activity at any given point in time is simply a point in our three-dimensional state space. So let's say we plotted many points, many time points in this plot. What we find is that activity doesn't seem to span the space uniformly, but instead is often confined to subspaces within the higher dimensional space. So in our, our simple three-dimensional example, a lower dimensional space might be a simple two-dimensional plane within the, the three-dimensional space. This is a really high-level summary of a concept you've probably heard of known as neural manifolds um, or neural subspaces. And you know this, this should make some intuitive sense. So we know that, you know, in a network of neurons, their activity shouldn't be independent, it should be coordinated, and we don't expect to see every imaginable combination of activity. But what I want to spend a little bit more time talking about today is another phenomenon we notice, is that activity doesn't kind of move around the space in, in random ways, but rather they're stereotyped temporal patterns to um, the activity's evolution. And we would call those uh, patterns dynamics. Um, so, you know, the, the rules that govern how activity evolves over time. So there are some cases where activity is really highly predictable, and we could say that that could be modeled by an autonomous dynamical system. So, you know, I've, I've graphically depicted that by this vector flow field here, and in an equation that would be the change in the system state with respect to time is some function of the current state. So these arrows tell you, you know, if you're at this point in your state space, how you expect activity to evolve over time. So this is really just, you know, a, a visualization of a very simple equation that just tells us that activity is predictable. If you know kind of where you are right now, you know how activity will change over time. So let me give you an example of a case where activity is, you know, quite so predictable. Um, an example from, uh, you know, Mark Churchland, John Cunningham, uh, and others in Krishna Shinoi's group, uh, their paper from 2012, where they looked at activity in motor cortex in monkeys uh, performing a reaching task. And this was a specific task known as a delayed reaching task. And at a high level, what they found is that motor cortical activity is set to an initial state during the preparatory phase of the task. And then activity during the movement, during movement execution is highly predictable based on that initial state of the system during the preparatory state. So what I mean by that is uh, in this task, you know, it, um, the monkey is always starting at the center of a workspace and a target would pop up somewhere. And they, this is a, they'd have a virtual maze. So they train the monkey to avoid barriers and that allows them to kind of instruct maybe curved reaches rather than just straight point to point reaches. And the key, the key point of this delayed paradigm is that the target pops up, but the monkey knows it's not supposed to go. And this gives the monkey a chance to prepare the upcoming movement. And during that time, they found that motor cortex is set to an initial state. 
during the preparatory phase. And then when the monkey gets a go cue, he actually executes the movement. And activity during movement execution was highly predictable based on that initial state. So when they analyze this data, so this could be one condition, and their task actually had a total of 108 different conditions, the so different targets and configurations of this maze. So when they analyze the data, so when we record neural activity, you know, what we actually get kind of on individual trials is some number of neurons uh, by time. This, each one of these boxes represents an individual trial colored by the different conditions of the tasks that the monkey was performing. So the first thing they did when they analyzed this activity was average across repeated trials of the same condition. So now we have trial average activity. So now each row represents the average firing rate of a given neuron for that uh, behavioral condition. And we have a few different, you know, a hundred different behavioral conditions in this case. And so they took this trial average activity and used simple dimensionality reduction to analyze it in a, a reduced dimensional state space. And so here's what they found. So, you know, this is, these are the, the hand trajectories, so the, the reaches that the monkey actually made um, in different colors here. And this is what the neural population activity was doing in the state space view um, as the monkey made those reaches. So the dots represent the initial state. So after the monkey had prepared each of those different reaches and the trajectories represent how activity evolved over time as the monkey actually executed those reaches. And so what they see here, uh, so this is the state of the system during preparation. This is how it evolves over time for the different conditions. And they um, they found that this is evident of, of underlying dynamics in the neural population. So simple rules that govern how activity evolves over time, uh, just as I was talking about before, where the change in state as a function of time can be described by a consistent set of rules. And if you know where the system starts, you can predict how activities can evolve over time, just knowing kind of this rules that these rules that govern all of the different conditions. And I should mention, you know, the, the, this is a two this is two hundred neurons out of a much larger you know system. Uh, so this is obviously you know this plane is a very simplified view of what the neural population activity uh, is doing. So I'm just using it to kind of illustrate the concept of highly kind of predictable underlying dynamics. So, you know, our goal with LFADS was to try to see if we could infer these types of dynamics from single trial activity rather than having to average across many repeats of the same movement. And so, you know, if you kind of believe that there's an underlying dynamical system here, then that dynamical system should be present on individual trials. You shouldn't have to average across trials uh, to uh, you know for that for that to be relevant, and the basic idea here is you know so we for a given trial we have spiking activities so some number of neurons by time, and that trial we should be able to represent each individual trial by a different initial state, and we should be able to learn one consistent set of dynamic rules that describes how activity evolves over time. Uh, so those are the, you know, that vector flow field, the dynamics that I was talking about earlier. And given the initial state and those dynamic rules, you should just be able to kind of integrate over time to describe how the activity evolves during that window. So how do we actually do this? We do this with something uh, known as an autoencoder. So a neural network architecture known as an autoencoder. Um, so some of you might be familiar with autoencoders, but at, at a very high level, the goal of an autoencoder is to find a compressed representation of your data that best reconstructs that same data. So the input to the autoencoder is the data, in this case, Z, and the output of the autoencoder is a reconstruction of that data, uh, in this case, you know, Z hat. And the goal here uh, is to use two networks, an encoding network, which takes the input data and outputs a compressed representation. So in this simple example, taking four dimensions of input and outputting one dimension. And then a decoding network that has to take that compressed representation and recover, or as best as it can, the original signal. So try to reconstruct the data. And the point of this architecture is that this act of compression forces this kind of pair of networks to preserve important features in the data, 
while discarding unimportant features. So for example, noise. So this is you know, kind of the, the intuition behind things like denoising autoencoders, where you know, they find informative compressed representations and discard uh, uninformative, and uninformative features like noise. So LFADS, or latent factor analysis via dynamical systems, is a sequential autoencoder. And I should mention this is um, you know, jo joint work with uh, David Cicillo, an adjunct professor at Stanford, who's uh, also at Facebook now. Um, so LFADS is designed to take in our single trial spiking activity. And we're going to use two neural networks to try to you know, reconstruct that same activity. So first, we have an encoder network. That's a recurrent neural network, which takes in the spiking activity and learns the mapping onto initial states. So the output of this network is a vector, uh, a different vector for each trial. Then we have a second network, the generator network, which is also a recurrent neural network, who takes that initial state and tries to reproduce the entire trial's worth of activity. Um, and that network should be learning a consistent set of dynamics for all trials. Um, a, a little specific point here is that the network isn't trying to regenerate the spiking activity itself. Rather, we assume that each neuron's activity can be represented by an underlying firing rate, a time-varying firing rate. And so we train the network. Uh, the cost function for the network is the Poisson likelihood of the observed spiking activity given the firing rate's output by the network. And then one other point here is that I mentioned that neural activity is often lower dimensional than the number of neurons that we observe. So we can build that in here by having, uh, you know, having the output of the neural network be lower dimensional than the full number of neurons. So we, you know, we have an optional set of latent factors here that describes a high dimensional activity. Okay, so just some, some key points for why this works well. Recurrent neural networks are themselves nonlinear dynamical systems. So this is simply a way of training a neural network to approximate the dynamics of what we think the dynamics are of the observed uh, neural population. And so, you know, this is completely unsupervised. The recurrent neural networks are initialized with completely random weights. And those recurrent weights are adjusted during model training to try to approximate the dynamics of the neural system that we're studying. So how well does it work? We can take the, um, you know, the single trial spiking activity for those different conditions and you know, throw those into LFADs in a completely unsupervised way, so without kind of labeling the trials for different behaviors, and then analyze the output of LFADs using the same kind of re dimensionality reduction approaches as before and see what it tells us. And here's what we found. So this is the same data from Mark Churchland and John Cunningham's paper. And we see these kind of same underlying dynamics where here each dot represents the initial state of the system. But the key difference is here, each dot is an individual, is a state of the system for an individual trial rather than having to average across trials. And the system has learned what you can see is kind of one set of consistent dynamical rules apply across all these trials. So this is 2,100 trials for a monkey kind of reaching across an hour, you know, an hour and a half of performing this task. And the key point is, uh, you know, we didn't bake in anything. So this is unsupervised. We didn't tell the system what types of behavior the, the monkey's performing. And we definitely didn't tell it what types of dynamics to expect. We just simply said, model this as an autonomous dynamical system, and then went back after the fact and said, you know, what did it find? So this is a nice confirmation that, you know, we, we could find the same dynamics that they found using trial averaging, but now on individual trials. And so, that, you know, that was a cool confirmation, I think, that the system worked. Um, but this is really just a visualization. I think a, a, another really important finding of the, from our LFADS paper was that, you know, these representations improve decoding of the animal's behavior, even though they're found in a completely unsupervised way. So what I mean by that, here is an example um, of a single condition where the monkey is reaching kind of up and to the left in this curved trajectory. We can, we can take the neural activity and denoise it in a couple different ways. So you might use smoothing through something like a Kalman filter, or you might use a different uh, analysis method known as Gaussian process factor analysis. 
and take the, the output of those methods and decode it using simple linear, uh, optimal linear estimation, which is basically linear regression. And as you can see, when we decode that, we're getting, you know, some, some of the movement correctly, you know, kind of know, we kind of know what direction the animal is reaching in, but the details of the movement are really not captured very well. And we can quantify that by asking how much of the variance of the animal's hand velocity we're able to, to uncover. And we get about 70% for these two different methods. But if we simply denoise the activity using LFADS and then apply the same simple linear uh, decoding approach, now you can see that we're getting, you know, we're much more precisely capturing the animal's behavior uh, on a single trial basis. And the, the variance accounted for jumps to about 90%, which is a very large improvement in decoding performance. So to me, you know, one of the, one of the key findings of this work is that this view that we're talking about, this kind of state space or dynamics view goes beyond visualization. It's informative about behavior on single trials and on millisecond time scales. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and tell you about our efforts to generalize these modeling approaches to, to situations with unpredictable activity. So we covered a case where activity was highly predictable, uh, which was a consequence of the task, and tested whether our method could uncover informative representations on single trials by modeling activity with an autonomous dynamical system. But this type of model is really only applicable in restricted scenarios. You know, brain activity obviously can't be completely predictable in general, because of course, to interact with the world, you know, we respond to new information all the time. How can we model that process in our dynamical systems formulation? So let's imagine a case where activity doesn't seem to follow the dynamic rules that we've learned. In the dynamical systems framework, you know, so here we might have predicted activity would do this, and then what we actually observe is activity, you know, kind of jumping out to here. In the dynamical systems framework, we could think of this as evidence that some input has come in and perturbed the system. So to account for this, we need to generalize our model to allow for inputs. In mathematical terms, that would mean the change in state with respect to time is a function not only of the current state, but potentially any inputs that might have come in and perturbed the system. And if I pause and get on my soapbox for a second, uh, I'd say that developing methods that can reliably uncover inputs to a dynamical system is probably one of the most important challenges we currently face in using dynamical systems methods and frameworks to interpret the computations performed by neural populations. So let me show you how we adapted LFADS for this challenge. So in the basic model, this generator recurrent neural network was given an initial state for each trial, and it had to reproduce the time varying activity by learning one set of dynamical rules that describes all trials. Now we want to expand the model so that each trial is described not only by an initial state, but also potentially a set of time varying inputs that might perturb the system's dynamics. Now to actually do this, the model architecture gets a bit more complicated. So we now add another neural network that we call the controller. And roughly speaking, you know, just for intuition, uh, the controller sees an encoding of the data and also sees the output of the generator through this feedback pathway. And it looks for cases where the generator out generator's output starts to diverge from the data. And it can correct for that divergence by injecting a time varying input U. So this gives us a model with the capacity to model un to account for unpredictable events. Now in the Nature Methods paper, as a proof of principle, we analyzed the data set from reaching under unpredictable perturbations and showed that LFADS was able to infer the presence, the timing, and the identity of those perturbations in a completely unsupervised manner. So without telling it anything about, you know, the the presence of those perturbations or really what the animal was doing. So you might already see a challenge with this approach, and that's that the model is starting to get pretty complicated. And like many deep learning methods, to get this to work, there are a lot of hyperparameters that need to be tuned. So for the machine learning aficionados in the audience, these are things like 
the strength of the L2 regularization penalties on the recurrent weights of the, of the RNNs, or uh, this is a variational method. So there are KL divergence penalties. Um, there are other things like dropout, learning rates, et cetera. And unfortunately, the proper settings of all these hyperparameters might depend on the data set size, the number of neurons, the brain area, the complexity of the behavior we're, we're recording, uh, et cetera. So in this recent preprint that you can you can now see on archive, we we demonstrated, um, you know, we, we started to explore what happens when you take this input driven model and apply it in more general situations. So we first showed what happens when we take the same delayed reaching data set and try the input driven LFADS model with a bunch of different hyperparameters. So here we're looking at model performance for 100 models with random hyperparameters. And let me unpack these axes for a second. So on the x-axis here, I'm showing the likelihood of the trained model. This is sort of the internal criteria that our machine learning approach uses to optimize the model. So lower, uh, lower scores here means better, better likelihood. So that's what the, the system's trying to optimize. Now on the y-axis, I'm showing a simple intuitive measure of model performance, which is the match between the trial average responses predicted by our model and the true responses. So this is obviously a really coarse measure of performance for a single trial method, but a good model should be able to get responses right on average. So what you see here on this diagonal is where things are working well. When the machine learning optimization approach thinks the model is doing better, it's actually doing better. But we also see this off-diagonal stuff, which is a phenomenon we refer to in our NeurIPS paper as pathological overfitting. Now, this might sound like a simple overfitting issue, but it's really something specific to autoencoders. So, you know, please read the NeurIPS paper for more detail. And it's, it's actually pretty hard to avoid. So we tested the same input-driven LFADS model on data from more brain areas and behaviors this includes data from somatosensory cortex taken in uh, Lee Miller's lab at Northwestern and data from uh, during, during a reaching task and data from dorsomedial frontal cortex taken from Merdad Jaitsalieri's lab at MIT during a cognitive timing task. And so we ran the input-driven models on these data. Um, and first I have to say, you know, it's pretty cool in general that we can model single trial dynamics in different brain areas and behaviors with this flexible model. But we do see the same problem. You know, there are cases where, where we thought we might be doing better, the models are actually not performing better. So we see kind of that pathological overfitting issues. And another issue here is that there's a pretty wide range of performance possible with different hyperparameter settings. So it's hard to know how to adjust these settings. We don't want somebody to have to be a machine learning expert just to be able to use this method. So, you know, in the limited uh, time, um, I'll just, you know, briefly tell you about the two key innovations of auto LFADS. Uh, so we, you know, we developed this new method, which we're calling auto LFADS. Um, and it's hard to give a deep dive into the technical innovations. But one key innovation was something we called coordinated dropout which is to solve that pathological overfitting problem I told you about earlier. Um, basically, a common approach in machine learning is a regularization strategy known as dropout, where during training, you randomly mask out the uh, incoming data coming into a network. And this is super helpful for building robust networks. In coordinated dropout, we take this a step further, where we mask out data at the input and modify our objective function or our loss function to only be computed on the complement of that mask, meaning data that's sent in as input is never used to compute loss at, at the output. And for some intuition, this forces the network to model structure that's shared across data points, in this case, neurons. And so this eliminated pathological overfitting. Another key uh, change here is to use um, a, an optimization approach known as population-based training, uh, which was developed at DeepMind. Um, to find good hy uh, hyperparameters. So just really briefly, we start out with a bunch of models with different hyperparameters and we train them in parallel. And then we, you know, we look for cases where models are not performing well and we get rid of those models you know, over the course of training. We get rid of them 
and replace them with models that are performing well, and we mutate that model's hyperparameters. And through, through the course of training using this evolutionary approach, we eventually kind of converge to good hyperparameter solutions in a completely automated way. So let's just see how the new method did. So when we apply it to the same motor cortical data, rather than getting a wide range of performance and having to choose a model somehow, AutoLFADS gives us one model back that avoids pathological overfitting and actually outperforms all 100 LFADS models I showed you earlier. And we see a similar effect for the somatosensory cortical data and the uh, DMFC data, one model that outperforms all other LFADS models. And we show a lot of other forms of validation in the paper, please check it out if you get a chance. So now we have a model, uh, we have a method to model input-driven dynamics that's truly applicable across a broad range of brain areas and behaviors. And a key point here is that this is fully automated and unsupervised. So we didn't tell the model anything about the behavior of the animals performing, and it didn't require any machine learning expertise to tweak the approach and tune it to different data sets. And to really drive that point home, let me just show you how this works for a very different data set. This is a random target reaching task, data from Flip Saves Lab, formerly at UCSF. So targets appear randomly on this grid. And that means 64 potential starting locations for each reach, 64 potential ending locations. That's some combinatorially large number of conditions that I can't really compute in my head. But for any particular condition, so for any particular condition, you know, in some reasonable amount of data, you're probably only going to see that reach one time. So this makes it really hard to analyze the data with traditional trial averaging approaches. Now to send this data into LFADS, we just chop it up into continuous neural data. We chop up the continuous neural data stream into segments. That means for any one of these segments, a target could come on at any time. The monkey could be in the middle of a reach. It could make an error, et cetera. Um, but this is our input-driven model, so we shouldn't need to enforce trial structure. Unpredictable changes should be modeled by inputs. And here's what we see when we test 100 different models. Again, the x-axis here is how well the optimization approach thought it was doing. And for the y-axis, we can't compute average responses in this case because it's hard to trial average. So I'm simply showing you how well we could decode the animal's behavior uh, based on the output of the model. And we see the same trend of, of before. There's a range where the optimization approach is performing well, and then pathological overfitting occurs. So now when we run this data through auto LFADS, we get one model back whose performance outperforms all of the other LFADS models. And we didn't have to tune any hyperparameters or really do anything specific for this very different data set. And to give you some intuition for how the model is doing, here we're just plotting the single trial state space trajectories computed for this data, either by smoothing the activity and applying PCA or by applying PCA to the auto LFADS rates. So you can see that this one's a bit of a mess and this one's showing clear structure. And we also colored the traces based on the direction the animal that was reaching in. And what you see is despite not knowing anything about the actual behavior that was being performed in any of these segments, the representations that auto LFADS inferred show quite a bit of structure related to the animal's behavior. And so this is motor cortical data, which has clear correspondence to measured behavior, and that allows us to validate our model. But there's nothing specific about the fact that this is motor cortex or reaching. Really, we just took a continuous stream of neural population activity, chopped it up into a bunch of segments, and told the system to model it as an input-driven dynamical system. And you see that it pulls out these representations that are really informative about behavior in a completely unsupervised manner. Okay, so um, with I've, I've told you about how our approaches, uh, you know, to model neural population dynamics on single trials, how we're generalizing them to new applications. Um, now let's shift gears a little bit in the remaining time and talk to you about a new application for these methods, which is modeling the dynamics underlying two-photon calcium imaging using an approach that we call RADICAL, the recurrent autoencoder for discovering image calcium latents, RADICAL. So obviously we spend about as much time on the acronym as we did on the method. So for those of you who might not be familiar, 
Two photon calcium imaging is really a powerful way to monitor neural population activity. It's quite complementary to, <coughs> excuse me, to electrophysiology. So with electrophysiology, we might get a sparse sampling of relatively active neurons in a local area around the electrodes. Two photon calcium imaging allows us to monitor vast populations of neurons. So increasing from tens of thousands of neurons to even a million neurons in recent reports. And in the three dimensions, often with layers and cell types identified. So it could be a really powerful way to probe the actual neural circuitry that gives rise to those population dynamics that we've been talking about, you know, primarily in abstract terms. But there's a couple challenges with calcium imaging. And one of the key challenges is that it's really an indirect measurement of spiking activity. The fluorescent signals we measure are a low pass filtered and non-linearly distorted version of the true spiking activity. And there are a number of noise sources here as well. So we can use techniques like deconvolution to try to estimate spikes or events from the measured calcium activity. But this process has limited accuracy and especially on finer timescales like the millisecond timescale dynamics that I've been talking about. There's a second key trade-off with two-photon imaging that relates to how acquisition is actually performed by laser scanning. So the fluorescent signals are sampled by a laser that serially scans through the field of view. So let's imagine that we have five neurons in our field of view. The laser might start at the top and gradually go down as we go through a frame. So it'll sample neuron one first and then two, and then really like four and five at the end of a frame. Typical scanning times might be around 30 hertz for fast scanning. So let's just say this frame length is about 32 milliseconds. Um, the key point here is that there's a trade-off between the temporal resolution uh, we can monitor the neurons, uh, the spatial resolution we get, and the size of the field of view, which is going to determine how many neurons we can sample from. And so the goal of our method is to see whether we can overcome this trade-off to some degree by leveraging the dynamics of the neural population. A typical way one might process calcium imaging data is to deconvolve and obtain event rates for each neuron at each time point. And the bin size here typically is matched to the frame rate. So we treat all the neurons as if they were sampled at the same time. Uh, but really, the neurons are sampled at different known staggered times within the frame. So in radical, we use bins that are smaller than the actual frame times and put each neuron's inferred events into a proper narrow uh, bin. So we still have the same low sampling rate for each individual neuron, but we have a high sampling rate at the level of the population. We have a lot more precision uh, for uh, those, those event times. The problem is that this results in kind of neuron time points here that uh, don't actually have any defined data. So if we want to train a model uh, to model these population dynamics, it's a bit tricky. Um, I can't go into the technical details here, but we developed a novel training method known as selective backpropagation through time to overcome this problem, which we outline in a paper that's about to be presented in NeurIPS. Um, and we also showed you know, kind of applications of this to uh, bandwidth limitations and electrophysiology in that paper. But let me just show you how, how this helps us uh, in calcium imaging. So we have a ton of results. Unfortunately, I don't have time to present, but they're available on BioArchive preprint. Really, I'll quickly mention that we tested radical using a synthetic dynamical system called a Lorenz system, where we could simulate fluorescence traces, uh, simulate fluorescence traces and um, spiking activity, uh, deconvolve to get events, and tested the ability of radical to uncover the true underlying dynamics that we know because we simulated the system. And we can run the system at a bunch of different frequencies. And you know, just to summarize what we're seeing here, uh, we tested the ability to recover the true underlying dynamics. And we already see that using auto LFADs on these data is a huge improvement over you know, kind of simple approaches like uh, smoothing the deconvolved events. But with Radical, we're able to recover the simulated dynamics with um, high accuracy out to much higher temporal frequencies. 
And so that was the point of the simulated system is that we could really control the frequency of the system and test how well we could recover. And we see a huge improvement at higher frequencies with this radical approach. And then we also tested this system using data from uh, two photon uh, imaging data collected uh, uh, in Matt Kaufman's lab um, with mice performing a water grab task where they might reach to one of two different spouts to grab water and bring it back to their mouth. Um, so that task kind of has two high level conditions, but a big difference with mice as opposed to um, you know, the monkeys that we talked about earlier is that we don't see kind of the same, le same level of stereotype behavior. There's a lot of variability to the behavior. So each individual trial uh, can be a lot, you know, can be quite variable. Um, so we subdivided these conditions into, into um, groupings here. So, you know, for the rightward spout, high right uh, reaches um, versus high left or low right and high left versus low left. And then we tested, you know, we, we applied radical to the deconvolved fluorescence traces and tested our ability to decode the animal's behavior. And so here are the true reaching trajectories for one of the mice that we tested this on for you know, right reaches and left reaches for two different conditions. And we see that radical allows us to infer kind of structure that is relevant to these kind of subcondition single, uh, single trial behavioral variability much better than even auto LFADs did or um, smoothing the data. And we can quantify that by uh, plotting kind of the decoding performance. Here and you can see that radical um, substantially improves our ability to decode, especially for higher frequency signals like the animal's velocity as opposed to position. So, you know, obviously very short treatment of um, a much longer paper. So please, you know, check out the bioarchive paper if you're interested. And so, in in my final kind of few minutes here. I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, our efforts to coordinate and hopefully accelerate you know, efforts in the field for latent variable modeling through a project we're calling the Neural Latence Benchmark. And you know, I'll just I'll just get on my soapbox again for a second here. You know, in, in all these projects where we've been trying trying to develop machine learning methods to model population dynamics, one of the things we realized is that you know the field uh, is a little bit um, is a little bit uncoordinated. So each model developer, you know, has to figure out what data sets to apply their models to, and what metrics they should be using uh, to evaluate their models, and what are the relevant points of comparison. And then from the user standpoint, it's hard to know which models are most appropriate for your data. Uh, you know, there are, there are a bunch of different great latent variable modeling techniques being developed every week. And so it's really hard to know, you know, uh, which one somebody should use. So, you know, just at a very high level, we're hoping that um, we can try to establish some standardization in this field. Um, and we've done this by, uh, our, our attempt here is to curate data sets. So we've curated some data sets with collaborators across, you know, motor cortex, um, some sensory cortex, cognitive areas. Um, and we've also provided some standardized metrics for evaluation. And this was a real challenge, coming up with metrics that could, you know, could, you know, give us, that could be informative across brain areas and behaviors that didn't make assumptions about kind of the specifics of the modeling approach being used. So those are, it was, you know, uh, I'd say a hard intellectual problem, but we have some, a wonderful team and some great coll collaborators uh, that we worked through that with. So, you know, Basically, uh, this is kind of a call to arms here. We have these data sets out there. We have um, metrics for evaluating them. We have private held out data that you don't get access to that, you, that we use to, uh, to, to evaluate your models. So you submit predictions and we evaluate your models that way. And we're hoping that this uh, creates sort of a, a standard way of, of comparing models at a high level. And I think this is really you know, just a starting point where um, there are a lot of different ways, uh, you know, a lot of different kind of challenges we can standardize the field around. So I'll just mention, you know, this isn't just a benchmark, but we're, we're also putting up some money here. So we have these different data sets, a few different ways in which um, uh, we're, 
so you know the different data sets we have some different challenges like being able to model data sets of different sizes as well and you know there's uh i think nine thousand dollars on maybe eight thousand dollars on the line here to uh people who can win different challenges um so give it a shot uh we'd love to hear back from you the deadline for this is january 7th and you know we'd, we'd love to see kind of what creative approaches the field is developing so with that, I just want to acknowledge, you know, the the amazing, talented uh, uh, folks in my lab, and I've been so fortunate to work with just a wonderful set of mentors and collaborators, and and more broadly, and you know, generous uh, funding funding sources. Thank you very much. Excellent talk, Jathan. Thank you so much. A um, lot of activity in the chat. Unfortunately, I'm the only one that you're going to hear uh, <laughs> clapping for you, but really um, beautifully presented and beautiful work. Um, we have a bunch of questions um, in the in the Q&A section in, in a few minutes. So uh, let me go ahead and pick a few of those off. Um, the top voted question here, you touched on this a little bit when you showed LFADs being applied to some other areas, but um, I think this question gets at something a little different, which is, has the idea of the brain as a dynamical system also been tested as explicitly outside of motor cortex? So beyond just LFADs, you'll be able to do some prediction. What would you say about um, the, the role of dynamical systems in modeling kind of outside of motor cortex? Explicitly? Yeah, that's a really great question. So, you know, I, I think of motor cortex as a great model system for, for you know, investigating dynamics or modeling activity as, as a uh, um, with dynamics. And I, I showed you kind of cases where, you know, the behavior we can instruct and the behaviors we can measure are really helpful for validating the dynamics. But there's there's great work happening in a lot of systems. Um, you know, so, you know, for example, I'll, I'll just highlight, you know, some of the work from uh, our collaborator, Merida Jazayeri in uh, dorsal medial frontal cortex. And I think, you know, this work is really fascinating because they're, you know, we don't that they're looking at a cognitive task a cognitive timing task where mm -hmm. what you're really looking at what you're really you know trying to investigate is something that's internal to the animal it's internal estimate of the timing of these events that it's presented with um and so like in motor cortex we have these amazing like moment by moment we can look at the arm velocity and you know validate our approaches but you know cognitive areas it's it's really impressive um that they're able to study dynamics. And you can see why, why single trial variability becomes much more important in those areas because you know that there's a lot more single trial variability just naturally inherent in these processes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And I think like, you know, um, when I get on my soapbox, I'm I'm definitely saying that you know we should test out these tools in as, in as many brain areas as we can and really kind of uh, allow them to you know affect neuroscience more broadly. I imagine with the cognitive tasks, much harder to know what ground truth you're comparing against to know whether you found exactly. something that's so, meaningful you know, or not. For example, with the tasks that we were looking at, the trials might be somewhere between a second and three seconds long, and you get one variable basically that you correlate, you know, your activity to, which is the animal's yeah. reaction time. So you're looking at, you know, one to three seconds of data and trying to predict one number. Um, it's really hard to kind of constrain your models with supervised approaches. And that's where kind of unsupervised approaches can be really valuable. Yeah. Um, another question here, during training, does the encoder see the entire trial? And if so, if so, at test time, are you able to unroll the generator to predict further into the future than what the encoder saw? And what is that? Yeah, that's a really comments? wonderful question too. Um, in, in, the, in the original paper, for sure, you know, we let the encoder see the entire trial and you know we didn't really test it on uh you know kind of i think what you're talking about is forward prediction so if you kind of ran the model forward right. you know how accurately would it still describe the data and that's maybe where i'll say you know if you get on the neural latency benchmark now one of the things i'm really excited about is that we did include kind of a forward prediction metric there so one of the ways in which you can compare and rank the different methods is by how well they can predict activity out to the future. Um, so, you know, as you'd expect, uh, prediction gets worse over time. Um, 
And that might depend on the task, like the random target task has more unpredictable events. So you shouldn't expect to predict that, you know, that many steps into the future. Whereas the, um, the maze task where dynamics are largely, you know, are, are highly predictable, you should be able to, to test that out to the future. So I'll just say, um, we personally don't have a paper on this. A lot of other latent variable methods have evaluated for forward prediction. Um, but I, you know, we included that in the benchmark as a way of, of evaluating and comparing methods. Great. Um, just a couple more. I think that some of them will be brief, so we'll go ahead and try to get to them. Um, we have one question about how performance varies with the number of neurons. So what's the minimum number of, of neurons or simulated neurons you need to get good estimate of the dynamics? And then on the other end, do you see um, asymptotes in the performance as your population gets, gets um, large enough? Anything about that? Yeah, or am I, I'm still screen sharing, right? You are, yep. Okay, great. So um, just as an example from the original paper, um, this is where we, we you know, kind of did exactly what you're asking, which is measure performance as a number of neurons uh, at, with the number of neurons. So we, you know, we could subsample from the full population of 200 neurons and test performance with let's say 150 or 100, you know, randomly drawing different samples. And you know, what, we've, what we found here is that at least you know, for, for LFAD's performance, there is a range in which it was relatively stable. You do see a drop off, and I'm not sure that we've we've saturated. I, you know, maybe there's a little bit of room for improvement here around 200, but I think this fall off was more gentle for LFADs than for other methods. And we found that you know even with 25 to 50 neurons and LFADs, you could do better than the full population of 200 neurons in previous methods. So really, you know, leveraging population activity um, in these kind of, you know, with these deep learning methods uh, can be kind of a powerful way to accommodate, um, you know, even smaller populations. And we, we show something similar in the radical preprint, if you take a look with a, kind of a neuron dropping experiment. Great. All right, I'm gonna collapse two more questions uh, into one and we need just like a 20 second answer for them. All right. Oh boy. So. Um, has Radical, uh, have you thought about using it in online settings? So thinking about BMIs and for any of your methods, Radical or LFADs, um, any thoughts about applying them to LFP data rather than spiking data? So just broadly, could you say something about online performance and continuous LFP um, variables within All right, so 20 seconds, I'm gonna talk like the micro machines guy, which none of the students here know what I'm talking about. Um, so online performance, um, we've tested we've tested the models uh, running LFADs online, and you can do it in about the 20, 20, 25 millisecond time step, which isn't bad. But in uh, we have another preprint on alternate architectures that use uh, transformers, uh, which are able to do inference much faster. So there there are kind of ways of getting similar performance with different architectures. The other question, shoot, LFP. Oh, LFP. So. Uh, an, another preprint to look at, we did some collaborative work with Mark Slutsky, who's at Northwestern, uh, where we applied these methods to electric corticography, which is similar to LFP. Mm -hmm. It's a continuous signal. It's, um, and, you know, we showed that these methods can be really useful there. LFP, you know, from intercortical data is an active area in the lab, and I'm, I'm sure it'll be valuable for those signals as well. Great. All right. With that, we are going to wrap this session. Uh, Chathan, thank you so, so much. Really excited to see the work that you're presenting and thank you for taking the time to be here. Thank you everyone um, out in the audience for listening. You take a few minute break, talk to your neighbors in your meetup, go watch a flash talk in the flash talk hall. And at the top of the hour in five minutes, we'll start with our first short talk session of the meeting. All right, thank you very much, Chathan. Thank you and all the organizers and everybody for listening.